Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, as I mentioned, tonight's going to be a little bit different and that we're going to listen to a chant um, uh, on the Metta Sutta in English, and then I'm going to give a guided meditation on Metta, goodwill or loving friendliness. Um, but we'll start first of all with our, our three, I'll ring the gong and then we'll start with our three bows to Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha for those who'd like to do that. So we're studying the, the paramis, the 10 beautiful qualities of the mind that we want to uh, cultivate. And we're on number nine, which is metta, goodwill, loving friendliness, loving kindness. Um, and another translation that I uh, likes is acceptance, acceptance of reality. So we're going to listen to Sobhana. Uh, she was a previous um, uh, Stuart at Birkin Forest Monastery, and while she was there, she re did this recording. Metta Sutta, Discourse on Loving Kindness in English. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful, Calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, admitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness. One should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to wrong views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Oh. 
Okay, so the the first thing you want to do when you're sitting down to meditate is to take some time to get yourself in a comfortable position. So I'll just let you start doing that and I'm going to turn the heat down. So if you need any props, there's still some props left over there in the corner. Um, you want to make sure that your hips are the same level as your knees. Uh, otherwise, you kink off like you might want something more underneath of you. Otherwise, you have a tendency to kink off the, the nerves or the blood circulation, and then you get uncomfortable. <laughs> Another common problem is the shoulders dragging down. Um, and so if you, if you get sore upper back or shoulders, if you put a cushion or something under your hands, it sort of props them up a bit and makes it a little more comfortable. Uh, we want to be comfortable, relaxed, um, but not sleep inducing in our posture. <laughs> we want to stay alert, comfortable, but alert. So it usually means um, a straight spine. And we'll just do a body scan just to, to check to make sure that the body's as comfortable as it can be. Because we want to bring our attention inwards and, and settle our mind. And that's kind of hard to do if we're, if we're having aches and pains. So this is important to take some time to do this at the beginning. So just start with your, your scalp. Just let all the muscles of the scalp just be really loose and relaxed. And then the muscles around the eyes. Just very relaxed. And coming down to the jaw, allowing all the jaw muscles to be loose and relaxed. And then our head, our head is actually pretty heavy, but it sits on the first vertebrae, like on little rockers, like a rocking chair. So you can just sort of rock your head back and forth, just a millimeter or so back or a millimeter or so forward and just find that perfect point where it's just perfectly balanced. So it takes no, there's no weight or strain on the neck to balance the head. And now you can allow all the muscles of the neck to relax, lengthen. And next, the shoulders, letting them drop down and just hang like a, a coat on a coat hanger of the clavicles and the, and the rib, rib cage. Just relax, shoulders. Continue down the arms, the upper arm muscles, just letting the muscles lengthen and relax on the long bone, the muscles of the forearm, and all the little muscles in your hands. And coming back to our torso, just the upper back and chest. Letting all the muscles just hang on the rib cage there, like clothes on a coat hanger, just loose and relaxed. And then the mid torso, relax the muscles. And then down to the belly and lower back, loosen the belly. And our pelvis, just feeling yourself comfortably supported by the chair or the cushion. So all the muscles of your hips can just relax. 
and down to your thighs. They're fully supported by the chair or floor. So just allow them to lengthen and relax. The muscles of the lower leg, loose and relaxed. And all the tiny muscles of the foot, of the feet, nice and relaxed. And you can quickly scan the body again and just make sure everything's comfortable. If there's any areas that are calling to your attention, then just do what you can to adjust your posture, to make yourself as comfortable, pain-free as possible. And when the body's totally relaxed, then the only thing that's going to catch your attention is your breath, your breath coming in and out. So when this happens naturally, when the rest of your body is relaxed and comfortable, and then you notice your breath, this is the time to change your focus now to your breath, being aware of it coming in and going out. So just enjoy that sensation a comfortable sensation, just sort of like waves coming in on a shore and moving out again, the breath coming in, going out. Allow yourself to feel this in the whole body the breath coming in and the whole body sort of expanding like a balloon and then going out in just a little bit, the body becoming a little smaller and the breath coming in again, feeling that gentle expansion and then the relaxation as it goes out. And we can say some phrases, just silently to yourself, just say, may I be well. You can say, may I on the in-breath, and then be well on the out-breath. May I be well. May I be well. Now change the phrase to, may I be happy. And as we say these phrases, just find a, a place in your body where you do feel well, or where you do feel happy, and experience that as you're saying the phrases and feeling the breath coming in and out. Now we can change the phrases to, may I be peaceful. 
and just see if you can find some place within you that feels peaceful. And be aware of that as you say the phrases and feel the breath. Now change the phrase, may I be loving. And again, just find a place within you that feels loving. May I be loving. Now change the phrases to, may I feel ease. And just to find a place within you that feels at ease right now. And our last phrase for right now is, may I be safe. So find a place within you that feels safe. Here in this live room or the Zoom room with all your Kalyanamitas, your good spiritual friends, supporting you on the way. May I be safe. Notice if you have a sense of warmth within the body or some other good sense and just allow that expand to fill your entire body with this good feeling. And when it reaches your skin level, just feel it like a blanket a beautiful protective blanket all around you. And then allow this feeling to expand outwards into your aura surrounding your body. And see this as your field of metta, your field of goodwill, your field of loving friendliness. And now image a very good friend stepping into your field of metta your field of goodwill. So just allow them to be in this field as long as is comfortable for you. 
And then when it feels like enough, you can have them just step back, step outside of it. And also you can determine how close you allow them to get, come to you within that field, how close to your body you allow them to come towards you. So when you're doing this practice on your own, you can do this exercise as long as feels good for you. But for right now, just have your good friends step, step back and step out of your field of metta. But notice your field of metta being unchanged, staying the same, whether they were inside of it or stepping outside of it. And if you feel ready, now have a neutral person. Someone you don't have strong feelings of love towards or ill will towards, just maybe a person you pass on the street or just sort of a person you know peripherally. Just have a neutral feeling towards them. Just allow them to step inside of your field of metta. Again, just as far in as is comfortable for you. And just as long as is comfortable for you. And again, because of our time limit tonight, if they're still in within your field, just have them step out now. And if you're ready, only if you're ready, you can let someone that you have a difficult relationship with just step inside this field. And maybe it'll just be their big toe that Come, you feel comfortable letting them come in with. But just determine if at all you can let them come in, and if so, just how much, or if they can come in totally, how close they can come. And also be aware of how long it's comfortable for you to have them in your field of metta. And when it's enough, you can have them step out and see if you can maintain your field of meta unchanged, whether they're in it or out of it. We'll all finish speaking for now and you can continue to play with your field of metta, letting people in and having them step out. Or you can return to your usual object of meditation for the next 10 minutes or so.
Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we're doing the Paramis, and for those of you who are new, we're doing it from this book called Parami by um, Ajahn Suchito. We have one copy of the book left, hardcover, so if anybody would like that, it's here. And um, for those of you who don't have a copy, you can just go to the Amravati UK website and you can get a PDF of it on their website. Um, so the parami are the, as I mentioned, the beautiful qualities of the mind uh, that we want to develop. So metta, lots of different translations. Um, so it's basically do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, Bhante Gunaratana likes the uh, translation loving, loving friendliness. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than loving kindness, because he feels it's sort of more on a um, sort of an equal level rather than, you know, I'm doing better than you, so I'm going to be kind to you, but sort of more that's on a vertical scale. So he likes the friendliness thing because it's on a more on a horizontal scale, and he feels that captures the meaning better. Um, also known as goodwill and um, and Aya Himsa has also heard the translation, and she really likes the translation um, acceptance. Yeah, because I guess if you accept things, then you're, yeah. Uh, goodwill or loving friendliness is sort of the opposite of ill will. So if we're not accepting things, usually we're in a bad mood or feeling <laughs> negative. And so that makes sense. If we're accepting, then we can better, you know, better able to be of goodwill. So it's metta is abundant. It's not sort of a small thing. It's, you know, it's something that we spread in all directions, exalted, without boundaries, and as mentioned, free from ill will. It's the opposite of ill will. Um, I, I incorrectly said on Friday when I gave this talk that it was one of the recollections. It's not one of the official recollections that the Buddha gave. Uh, but in his book, Ajahn Suchito says that we can use it as a recollection. Um, so he's saying like during the day, you can just take a, a couple of minutes and just pause and, and recollect how you've been the recipient of freely given goodwill how others you know just remember how others have freely given their goodwill to you and he said you can acknowledge in your mind they didn't have to do that but they did it and so just bring that to mind um, another recollection can be when you're feeling in a negative mind state to to bring to mind that at times others have seen you with loving sympathetic eyes so feel that feeling and let it permeate your body when you're having, when you're in that negative state to help move aside that negative state. <laughs> and then the, another recollection that he recommended was if you're feeling mean, mean hearted, then recall times when you have felt this loving friendliness. So you don't sort of get this narrow view of yourself of, I'm a mean person. No, there's circumstances have led you to, to have this feeling arise at this moment, but you're more than that. You're bigger than that. You have times when you're also a loving person. <laughs> so those are three recollections that he recommends that we just take a few moments through and throughout the day to, to bring to mind. Certainly our sense of goodwill or metta gets blocked by ill will. Um, we want to practice metta until we can feel it. Even when we're having a bad day. I mean, it's easy to feel if we're having a good day and feeling good, but we want this practice to be so strong within us that even if we're having a totally rotten day, <laughs> that we can still feel this in our bodies. And not only that, 
that we can feel it not just towards our friends and our loved ones, but towards the dictators or murderers or rapists or whatever we want to be. It's an unconditional kind of love. Um, you know, being able to, it's not condoning any of these negative actions, but it's just seeing that these people are the way they are because of causes and conditions and, and being able to, to generate that goodwill in your body. Um, Ajahn Suchito says that the unconditional aspect of metta is more important than how intensely we feel. So our determination, our aditana, is to never allow our mind to move into hatred or ill will. So that's a big <laughs> calling for us. Uh, but, but we make aditanas or we make determinations for things that are difficult to do and then just slowly inch our, inch our way towards that, towards that goal. And when we can do that, then that really brings us close to awakening. In relationships, our ignorance often tells us there is something wrong with ourselves or with other people. So if we're always walking around feeling we have to improve or the other person has to improve, that really kills any sense of appreciation or joy. Mm. It's a joy killer. <laughs> so we have to be on the alert. We have to watch our minds for these, these thoughts arising. Um, and we have to hold the intention for a happy life and look on relationships in a kind and generous way. Metta is non-aversion. So we want to release others from being the objects of our projections, our desires, our idealism. That's a biggie. We need to release other people from having to live up to our idealism, our unfulfilled wishes, or our needs. We don't have to coerce others to be like us, and we don't need to make ourselves to be the same as others. And we don't need to win people over. We don't need to feel compelled to prove ourselves. What we want to do is to cultivate virtue, kindness, and discernment of what is wholesome versus unwholesome. That's what we're wanting to be focusing on, not trying to prove ourselves. So meta can be really used as a healing tool. We accept all our negative mind states as conditioned visitors to the mind and then work with them. There's nothing to hide or to dread. These negative thoughts and difficult emotions are not permanent. And they're not mine. They're not me or mine. They are due to basic instincts for survival shaped by our past experiences. So empathy is understanding that when we, we are, that when we act badly or others act badly, that we've been wounded that we've had difficult past experiences. So we have this tendency of sticking people into categories. So one is seeing them as better than we are, and then that makes us feel insecure. Another category is to see them as you know, worse than ourselves, and then that leads to a not nice feeling of contempt. Or we see them as the same of our, as ourselves. And that can lead to attraction. So we need to let go of this pigeonholing of, of people and see all people as suffering. And then it's important that when we send metta, when we send loving friendliness to another, friendliness to another, that we don't make it 
missionary kindness. <laughs> that is imposing a requirement on the other person that they benefit from our love. The intent with metta is to cultivate a field of kindness so the other or ourself is not met with fear or negativity. And it's important to know that we can't really truly bring metta or loving friendliness to others if we don't feel it for ourselves. You know, it's when the cup is full and runneth over that that's when, you know, when we can feel that metta for ourselves, then it, then there's an abundance of it to spread out to others. So we need to practice sending metta to ourselves when negative emotions arise. Use the holding technique. Um, We've got a lot of new people here. So the holding technique is when we have an emotion or whatever, usually there's thoughts in our head that are going along with that emotion. And the holding technique is to hold, is sort of to lovingly hold ourselves like we'd hurt, hold a hurt child. Because when we're feeling negative, we're the child, we're the, we're the being that's hurting right now. So we want to lovingly hold our attention, but not up in our head, because up in our head is all the, are all these negative thoughts. Like, why did they look at me like that? Or why did they say that? Or how could they do that? And that's just throwing fuel into the fire of this emotion. So where we're holding, where we're skillfully holding our attention is on the physical sensation of the emotion that's in our body most often in our heart chakra or our solar plexus. You know, it might be other places in the body, but I found those are the two commonest places. So you wanna get out of your head so that you're not fueling that emotion. You're lovingly holding that emotion. And because it's not being fueled, once the fuel that it had is used up, then it dissipates, it's gone. So that's a really, really important practice, this holding technique. And then when we can send, when we learn to send metta to ourselves, when we're having negative emotions, then we, then we can start sending it to other people when they're being negative. So that's, that's the development of compassion. So when we experience emotions without blame or defense or struggles, the result is compassion. Because compassion knows how terrible it is to be trapped in these negative emotions or in pain. So metta is not about conjuring up great feelings of emotional warmth. It's about not blaming yourself or others and not rehashing the past. So uh, Ajahn Suchito finishes this chapter with four homework suggestions. So this is in addition to those three recollections that were mentioned earlier. So the first homework is to minimize your critical speech about other people. If you feel that it's necessary to warn somebody about another person's uh, behavioral tendencies, you know, use as few words as possible and refer to their behavior as like an illness that they have to bear. And he gave an example uh, saying, oh, this person gets caught up by the tendency to dominate others. It's a much softer way to say it than, you know, saying, oh, that guy's really overbearing or <laughs> whatever. So really watch your critical speech. The second homework is to notice situations where you get irritated and then use these to do your meta practice. Extend a warm heart to yourself or to others around you. The third homework is to notice self-critical thoughts and practice meta to yourself. 
And the fourth is to not put people into categories. So I mentioned the three broad categories. They're better than me, they're worse than me, or they're the same as me. Try to let go of this, of the categorization and accept people just as they are because however they are, whatever behavior they're doing at the moment, they're much bigger than that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say tonight. So we've got plenty of time to discuss this topic of meta or ask questions. Microphone shy or something. <laughs> um, so this is something that's been arising quite frequently at yoga. And um and I've been trying to navigate the spiritability that's been arising and meta and when to take action and when to not and when to let it go. And um so my question is um uh, how do I move forth? Like I guess it's a for me, I just Feel like people just have a major lack of respect of other people's silence and mm -hmm. people come in like and talk loud while it's like the coffee shop or something mm -hmm. and we're all meditating and you know like which is so in the mind right and they're like okay let it go and send them maybe they need to do that or whatever mm -hmm. but then it's just and then it comes back and um i can't seem to get over it like it just it, i feel it and feel it and feel it and i try it method to myself i try method to them i try Oh man, this is going on for months. And I'm like, do I just avoid yoga now? Because it's just like, how dare they speak? Like, <laughs> you know, um, and it's just been something that's arising a lot with that that irritability. So I'm really glad you brought that up with mm -hmm. with that uh tonight because please help me. Yeah. <laughs> Earplugs. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I think in a situation like that speaking to whoever the teacher of the class is and getting you know finding out what their opinion is about this and and maybe you know giving reminders to people um uh yeah earplugs or doing the holding technique or like if you're noticing the irritation where are you physically feeling that in the body and then sending love to yourself to that physical sensation but staying out of the head because it's you're fueling it with your, you know, how dare they kinds of thoughts. You're just making that fire of irritation so much bigger. So get down into the, the feelings and yeah. And um, yeah, and, and that's one of the possibilities is not to go to yoga, I guess. Yeah, uh, but, the, but your practice is to yeah, to deal with this irritation. Yeah. I mean, a really high bar, super high bar is like, oh, thank you. Like they're a teacher, you know, for showing me where, because you don't want to be impatient and irritated with Rhea. And, and I mean, that's going to come, you know, and so getting to see your, your irritation, it is hard, but there is, there is actually a lot of wisdom in that, that, oh, this is, you know, and start with the like, bless my heart. Um, I can get pretty quickly, easily irritated. And I really think it's that phrase that Sangamitha used, that idealism. I, I think as soon as we, there's this expression, don't, don't keep shooting off yourself on yourself, you know, like sort of a play on words, but it is shooting the I shouldn't be like that. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't think this, you know. Um, and then we put it out to like, you shouldn't be talking in yoga. You shouldn't, the shooting, shooting, shooting. It's really familiar, close to another word, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's that idealism. And what, happens is that we end up suffering you know we have all these ideas about how the world is supposed to be and how people are supposed to be in this environment and that environment and and it's it we're just setting ourselves up for a lot of misery yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so 
to night I shifted and I started saying, so it's like this now. Yeah. So it's like yeah, this yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Like I could go, yeah. like I could go over and be like, what do you think? It's a coffee shop? <laughs> like where are you from? Or I could like politely go after, hey, you know, would you mind respecting silence? All these, you know, ideas are coming up. And then, you know, I just started saying, so it's like this. So it's like this now. And <laughs> just really because of exactly it, it's directly correlated to my 10-month-old daughter that mm -hmm. there are things that, you know, but it's like, yeah, it gets quite heated in there. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's really intense being a parent. And then you see all your idealisms, how things should be and and how you should be. And that's so, you can't, you, you just can't. I mean, no one can. Yeah. And on that note, I just wanted to say for people who were here last week, because I say I had that horrible conversation with my son on the phone. And I just want to say he texted me and apologized for being so grumpy. <laughs> and then he texted me again and said he actually got super sick the next day. Like he was so off. It was really a terrible call. <laughs> but I just wanted to exonerate my dear son. <laughs> Yeah, please, Glenn. Do, oh, can you? Wait, 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 wait. Okay, I will repeat then. Unless it's long. No, no, we can get it. We can probably get it back almost. Sure. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Great. Great. Um, if I recall correctly, one of the four noble truths is life is dukkha, life is suffering, and then the third is life dukkha can end. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so, and then number two is. God. The cause, which is desire, desire yes. causes dukkha. Yeah. So, and then just the fourth, no desire uh, means no dukkha. The path to the end of suffering, which is the noble eightfold path. Which is noble eightfold. Mm -hmm. So, at what point on on your path um, have you personally noted that suffering had ended? Number three. Can you recall? A moment when you were just like no i don't want to suffer anymore or was it more of a transition like a dissolve yes yeah. well i think i don't think all suffering goes until uh, until we're our mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah so <laughs> so suffering hasn't ended but i i think all of us can think of many instances where the suffering has decreased or um doesn't seem to be happening in certain situations anymore i mean that's what encourages you to continue on the path when you have those moments where um yeah suffering in a particular situation isn't happening anymore and it's just wonderful and the the third noble truth that there really is like a cessation of, of suffering that these are the moments that people are having enlightening ex enlightenment experiences so up until that time you're just it's very relative you're just experiencing uh, an alleviation of some of the intensity and the frequency and the duration and you, you see that more and more but until there's actually a, a, a breaking through our delusions um, there's not the like the the complete ending of suffering that the Buddha is saying is available. Mm -hmm. Did you hear death before? Mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> so Glenn's just asking, <laughs> is death a, moment, a, a, a cessation of? Um, no, because, because of the second noble truth, that the cause of, of the suffering that we're experiencing is because of our ignorance. And because of our ignorance, we're going about, we're going about we have desires that are ill-founded. They're they're just they're 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 impossible. It, we're you know there's there's no other way except that this would lead to a bad result. You know the the kinds of de desires that we have. So it's the, it's the ending of those desires that is when this uh, not the ending of this body, not the ending of this life. Yeah. yeah, because you take those desires, you know, your yeah. body dies, but then you're going to be so, reborn yeah. uh, with that yeah. comma. And so it just carries on. Yeah.
deep question. <laughs> Good one. Um, yeah, um, a lot of people will start their meditation, you know, well, actually, uh, I'll, I'll let Sarah speak in a moment, because I think this is your, your major meditation, but a lot of people will start their meditation, you know, do five or 10 minutes of metta, and then, and then move to breath or whatever their object of meditation is. Um, but some people have it as their major meditation object. And Sarah, do you want to say a few words? You want to give her the microphone? I have to sit in the way of my back. Um, yes, my uh, vehicle of meditation. Uh, I use the Brahma Vihara. Mm. So uh, metta, acceptance, loving kindliness. Um, Karuna, compassion, mudita, sympathetic joy, and upeka, equanimity. But um, how I use metta is uh, um, it's a feeling, so it's a physical sensation. And When you can sincerely, when I sincerely touch into that physical sensation, with a light attention to it, allows it to grow. And um, the Buddha gives uh, four beautiful similes of um, feeling these positive sensations in the body and permeating and diffusing the body with these beautiful qualities. And that's what happens naturally when the mind rests on them. And I, the other, if I were to say it, two things, I would say the feeling, the real, physical, tangible feeling. And the other thing I would say is that it's enjoyable. It's fun. <laughs> you want to go there. You want to be there. You want to rest there. And that, that also allows it to grow. And then once that momentum is going, then, then there's nothing to do but watch. Um, and so I think sometimes, particularly the Western mind, gets caught in a lot of verbalizations, or which are tools, but there's a time when that gets too heady, and you just really have to let go and feel, feel it, and enjoy it, and trust that those similes that the Buddha gave um, do lead to a collective mind. That's how I approach it. Beautiful. So um, Melissa is asking Sarah, from, Melissa from the back is asking Sarah um, about the, what Sarah said, that it, it's a physical feeling and there's a lot of joy. And Melissa just asked, has it always been like that for her? Um, yes, that's how I was, that's how I was taught. And that's, um, that's when my meditation really took off. Like it felt healing and enjoyable. And, um, if sometimes I want and I can't feel it, I, it, it seems absent and I can't seem to bring it up. And then I use 
different techniques that the Buddha has to um, try and soften the heart and soften the mind in order to touch it in even the smallest way. So like Adam Suchika was saying, beating into outer space. <laughs> Just even the tiniest, tiniest touch, like when you, you know, someone smiles at you or anything that gives the slightest warmth, um, then you know it's metta. So just like how to recognize it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just comment before we go to your question, Donna, <laughs> um, that. Sarah's lucky because it happened for her right away. But other people, they, it, it takes time to. Whoops, why are we getting echo? No. Anyway, other people, it takes time to cultivate it and, and uh, have it expressed. Um, so don't worry about it if it's not there right away. <laughs> so, and I'm really glad that Sarah brought up that meta is a feeling. We just use phrases sometimes as a skillful means to sort of get us in touch with it or, or, or have it come up. Um, yeah. And, and another skillful means for, for bringing that up is um, you can use memory of a time when something was, your heart was just broken open, your heart was just open or, or something that, that really um, just, you, can't, you, you know, you're just like, ah, you know, is a, a baby or a puppy or a, a kitten or like something that the, the thing about metta is that it needs to be this very sincere, you know, the sincerity, it has to be, and, but it, this is, it just it can be very small, but it's sincere, you know, and then, and then that will just, you can, it's like tr getting a fire going, you know, once you've got to a tiny bit, then you just can, it can, and Scott, it's like like the underpinning of the whole of all of our practice. Like we we all every meditator must because metta is acceptance, and we we have to accept we have to accept ourselves. We have to accept reality. It, it all it, you know. So, and how do you practice metta? I think. Sometimes it could be your primary meditation object or meditation vehicle. I think the other thing is it could be something that you start your meditation with. But often when you're you're coming up with against hindrances in your meditation time, you're you're invariably you're going to need to turn to metta, where you just first of all just accept that irritability or that discouragement or that doubt. You have to meet all of these things with acceptance. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Although we try it over and over and over. Okay, Donna. So for me, um, Meta came into my life at probably the darkest hour. I was using metta together with fast walking meditation to just get a hold of myself and try to get in touch with something that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of hours of walking meditation with metta. And I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it worked for me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Oh, I'd like to share, uh, or maybe Bodhipala, if you've got a microphone thing that works, share what you shared on Friday about metta is, it's, it's for us, you know, versus that missionary metta. 
Uh, yeah, not, no, not, no not, voice. <laughs> no, no sound at all. Not, not a. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now? Yes, great. <laughs> yeah, one of the settings, it just auto switches on me. It's very weird. Okay, um, so what I was uh, talking about last time, perhaps you'll relate to this experience is you're trying to generate metta and in could be just in your meditation or it could be in a real experience where you're faced with someone who's saying something that's causing you to feel uncomfortable or irritated. And you want to generate metta. You feel like, okay, I'm supposed to generate metta. And it's almost like you're pushing it and out and pushing it towards that person in the hopes that somehow you're going to change their mind, <laughs> that your metta will have an influence. And we go in Buddhist circles a little bit back and forth over the ability of anyone to influence other people's mind states. Sometimes we talk as if that's possible, but I think it's better to err on the side of it's not possible. And in fact, um, after that last talk, I read a sutta, which Sarah will know very well, the simile of the Saw Sutta, but the heart of it is really clear where the Buddha is saying, okay, you can't control circumstances and you definitely can't control other people and what they say and when they say it and how they say it or what they do or anything. Like he really goes through the list and he says, but you're still in those moments, if you um, start um, hoping that that's not going to be the case, you're going to reap your share of weariness and frustration, you know? So this kind of missionary metta feels like it could have that effect, but no, it's not like that. The metta, what does it do? He says, in those circumstances, you're generating metta, particularly in the way that Sangamita kind of was coaching us. You create a field or another way of thinking about it, depending on how you experience your mind as you're filling the space, the field of perception, your entire experience, your entire world, field of perception, what's happening. Um, Anyway, so, or another way of thinking about it is I have to fill the space between me and thing with this emotional tone that then will transform your experience because you, it's, it's going to allow those perceptions to arrive in a completely different mind space, right? You're, those perceptions are coming in. And the magic of it is if it's very strong and, and well-developed, and the Buddha describes it as so developed, it's like a cat skin, beautiful analogy that will make no sense to most of us. <laughs> but uh, I think of leather, beautiful, soft leather that you've worked and worked with your fingers and you've rubbed oils into it and the, the whole piece of leather that is this bag um, is now soft and malleable and gentle. So he says, if, if you have that, uh, all those perceptions that are coming in like darts or arrows towards you, you, they cannot make that bag rustle and crackle the way stiff leather does. So you're softening the mind and making it able to allow those perceptions to come in without having the, the kind of harsh effect that they used to have or could have, didn't have that beautiful field of perception already developed. And it just by fluke, and I'll finish up quickly, um, in another kind of Zoom meeting that I attended, one lady, she said, oh, you know, this is like that beautiful image um, in the scriptures where uh, 
Mara's armies are attacking the Buddha, I think, just before his enlightenment, and they're throwing arrows at it. And as they hit his perceptual field, they transform into flowers. And that's a great image for what the field of metta can do for you. <laughs> so it's it's when we say, we're, so Ajahn Sony always says, we're do, do us for our experience to transform our experience, not to change other people or have the expectation that you could possibly control anything around you. Anyway, that's, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, the um, that uh, elderly monk that was tortured, um, you know, and then escaped to Dharamsala and was interviewed by the the Dalai Lama, and you know, and his fingers were all sort of going all different kinds of angles from being broken so many times and the torture and and um, yeah and. He, you know, he was just constantly sending meta to the people that were torturing them and, and just thinking these poor people must be living in hell to be able to do this to another human being, you know, and, and um, yeah, so that's how he survived. And the Dalai yeah. Lama asked him if he was ever afraid. Yeah, and he, and he said he was, and what he was afraid of was not being harmed, he was afraid of losing his meta. He was afraid that at some yeah. point he'd lose his compassion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, I did weep when I read that. Story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I really, uh, in our, in the basic lessons on our website, under teachings, under basic lessons, the eight basic lessons, the lesson on I think love and joy. Um, at the bottom of the first sort of introductory paragraph before you get to the big PDF download, um, there's a link to a series, uh, a, a 10, 10 different talks by um, Bhante Sujato. And um, Metta is his main form of meditation. And he anyway it's a really beautiful series of talks where he really goes into depth helping you to develop meta so if you're interested in this is uh um i really encourage you to listen to those those 10 talks they're very beautiful uh, and that's where you can find the link Which, um, it's on the website under teachings, under the basic teachings, the eight basic lessons, and it's a lesson, I think, number four on love and joy. Okay, so we're so at time. Okay. Is that good? Yep. Yeah. Great. So um, I was just saying that, you know, we've just generally been unlocking the front door, but we can keep the back door unlocked as well. So maybe the first few people that come uh, can park in the back. There's place for four cars because we've already got one car parked back there, but there's a there's place, and so you'll sort of figure out who's the first here who brings a car, and if the first four people can park back there, that'll help the congestion out on the... And then once all the parking spaces that are in front of this property, which is two, uh, two properties wide, if you parked on Fifth Avenue, that's sort of like the ends of the rows of houses, so I think that's pretty safe to to park on fifth, then you're not in danger of blocking anybody from getting into their, their own driveway. Excellent. Okay, so um, 
will will close and it's it's the first are we still on the seventh or yeah we're on the seventh so <laughs> so our closing is the first Brahma Vihara Metta so that's very appropriate <laughs> may you be well may you be happy may you be peaceful may you be loving may you be calm may you be safe may no problems come to you May no difficulties come to you. May no harm come to you. May you meet with spiritual success. May you have the patience. May you have the strength, the courage, the determination, the inner clarity and the wisdom to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties in life to meet and overcome the inevitable problems in life, to meet and overcome the inevitable frustrations in life, and to meet and overcome the inevitable failures in life. May the whole of our hearts be filled with loving friendliness. May every cell of our bodies be filled with loving friendliness. May every level of our consciousness be purified by loving friendliness. May we build a healthy, happy aura of loving friendliness all around us, through which no evil thought, word, or intention, or any form of harm may penetrate, but from which loving friendliness may radiate in all directions, and may we be protected. May the merit of our practice be shared with all sentient beings, named and unnamed. Lise, Blair. May all beings be well and happy. Thank you, everyone. So next week, the last parami. <laughs> and and uh, this set, is it this Saturday? No. Next Saturday. Uh, we're having a be, uh, introduction uh, to Buddhism, basic concepts and meditation. Um, so I think there's still room uh, if anybody would like to register for that. Just send us an email. Um, our emails at the bottom of every page on the website in that black area, I think. Yeah. And there's a little tiny write up about the intro. It's from nine till four on Saturday, March 18th. And it's here. And you just bring a bag lunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not going to be on Zoom. It'll just be live. It'll just be live. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah on the 18th yeah. on the 18th and it, on the home page it's under latest news it's the first rectangle and then you click on it and you get some info yeah all right okay oops thank you